We know enough quantum now that we can start talking about more complicated objects like atoms. Now this is good because there is a major problem in the classical picture of Rutherford's atom, which has a dense charge in the nucleus surrounded by electrons. And that's that the charge relationship uh, says that the, the force between the two charges is gonna be inversely proportional to distance between them. So as they get closer and closer together, the force between them increases and eventually becomes infinite. So classical mechanics predicts electrons will fall into the nucleus and they'll do so very rapidly within about 16 picoseconds. So this is a problem because matter is stable. And so how can classical mechanics predict this very bizarre and physical result and still be correct? Well, presumably it can't. So the solution comes in 1913 due to the German physicist Niels Bohr. And what he says is that electrons do kind of orbit the nucleus, but these orbits are quantized. They can only have certain discrete energy values. So that's the same thing that Planck did in order to solve the ultraviolet catastrophe. He quantized light. And so according to Niels Bohr, there are certain radiuses at which we can have our orbits, and they're given by this formula, uh, which you don't need to worry about. But So we have our, our n, which is some integer, times h bar squared, divided by the charge of the nucleus, divided by that Coulomb constant, and the charge on the electron squared, and the mass of the electron. And so n is the thing that can vary here, and it can be any integer. It can be one, it can be two, it can be three, it can be four, etc. And so that will give us these different orbits, and then each of those orbits has a specific energy associated with it. And so now the reason the electrons can't fall in the nucleus is because the minimum possible configuration they can have is n equals one. They can't penetrate into this region down here by the nucleus. Now Bohr's model is also a magnificent success because it predicts hydrogen spectral lines, the different wavelengths at which um, hydrogen absorbs and emits. We should formally introduce this idea because it's very important. Um, this idea of atomic spectroscopy, where we can analyze different elements based on the, the wavelengths of the lights which they emit and absorb. This is the only way at, at this point that we can figure out the electronic structure of these atoms. There's no microscopes which are sufficient for probing them, but we can radiate them with light and see what we get back as a result. So each element, is going to absorb or emit light only at specific wavelengths. These are called spectral lines. So you can see here a comparison in the spectra of sodium atoms and calcium atoms. And these lines right here, these are represented as emission wavelengths. So we've heated up the sodium and now it's emitting these wavelengths. We could also shine light through a gas of sodium that was cool, in which case these would be absorption wavelengths. These would be the points where the light would be absorbed and all the rest of the light would be able to pass through. And you can see that these are different between the calcium and the sodium. These provide unique fingerprints for all the different atoms. Uh, this is actually how we know the composition of distant stars. Now stars are billions of light years away. We can never get an instrument over to actually take a sample and collect it and do things with it. But we can look at the light which is emitted by these stars and because of these unique fingerprints, we can figure out what the star is made of. And if these bands get shifted over a certain quantity, then we can use that to figure out how fast the star is moving away from us or towards us. And based on its, its brightness, if we have a, a standard star that, you know, there are certain stars that have typical luminosities, then depending on how dim it is or how bright it is, we can figure out how far away it is. So we can get lots of information just by examining the light from these things that we can never actually physically inspect. But as useful as this is, why are there spectral lines? Why do we get these unique bands for all the different elements? The Bohr model finally gives a prospective answer to the standing question about where these spectral lines come from. 
Now, according to Bohr's model, you have a photon, a piece of light, come in and is absorbed by an electron. Then an electron is going to go to another energy level. But remember, these energy levels are quantized. There's only certain allowed places the electron can go, which means there's only certain energies of photon that it can absorb. Same thing if that electron wants to go from a higher energy orbital to a lower energy orbital. Since these orbitals are quantized in energy, there's going to be distinct jumps that it can actually make. And the photon which is emitted is going to correspond to that difference in energy. And this is because of, of conservation energy. In order for this to go to energy state, that energy can't be created or destroyed. It has to go somewhere. So we have electron orbits with different energies. And our electrons can move up by absorbing a photon or down by emitting a photon. And the difference in energy of those two, two positions of the electron is going to correspond to the energy of the emitted photon. So now, now we can connect our, our energies for our electrons to the wavelengths and frequencies of these photons and figure out these spectral lines. So here is the, the visible spectrum for hydrogen. You can see hydrogen it doesn't radiate at a, a lot of frequencies. We just have a, a handful here of visible spectral lines where hydrogen will actually absorb and emit energy. Now there are a lot of different ways to transition between these different energy states. We could, for example, go from any of the higher energy states down to the lowest energy state where n equals 1. And each of these jumps represents a difference in energy, which represents then a different energy of light that's going to be given off. So in the case of our transitions down to n equals 1, these are very high energy. You can see these are our large jumps here. And so these fall in the ultraviolet region of the electromagnetic spectrum, where we have high energy light. And those you can't see. Uh, but if we consider the transitions from these um, higher energy states down to the state where n equals 2, then the first handful of these, the, the transition energy is, is small enough that the energy from the light it falls in the visible spectrum. And so we'll get some different colors of light. Then if you go to the next energy level, n equals 3, well now these energy differences are actually so small that our hydrogen is going to radiate in the infrared system, which is um, lower energy than red light. Now if we have, have some photographic paper, we can still capture pictures of these spectral lines. We just can't see them with the naked eye. Well, before Bohr has come up with this explanation, there's a pre-existing formula developed by the, the Swedish physicist, Rydberg. And this is his formula. He says that 1 over the wavelength is going to be equal to some constant known as the Rydberg constant. This can be different for every element. In this case, we're going to use hydrogen's value of 1.097 times 10 to the 7th inverse meters. Uh, times the difference of the squares of those two n transition points. So for example, this line right here is between n equals 1 and n equals 2. So that's what we would plug in to get the value of this light being given off. Now of course this has to be a positive number and the, the larger number, since it's in the denominator, will actually give a, a smaller value. So you want the larger number to be put over here as n2. Of course, if you get them backwards, you know you can just make a mental note and flip the sign, knowing that it has to be positive. So this gives a, a number of series. If we set n equals 1 and let the second n vary from 2, 3, 4, etc. So that's what we considered in this first case. Uh, then these bands of light are called the Lyman series. And they're all in the ultraviolet. Then our next series where we considered transitions down to n equals 2, that's the Balmer series, and the first few of those are visible, and then the rest are in the ultraviolet. And then there's the, the Passion series, which lands us in the infrared region. As an example, let's go ahead and figure out what the wavelength is for that very first transition that hydrogen makes, according to the, the Rydberg formula and according to the Bohr model. 
So the transition we're talking about, that's where we're going from the ground state energy, the lowest energy, where n equals one, to the next energy level, which is where n equals two. So we can pull out our Rydberg formula, and we want to find the wavelength. So let's go ahead and solve this for lambda. We want to flip lambda up top here, so that means we need to flip the other side, take its reciprocal. Okay, and then we can just plug in all these values here. We'll stick in the Rydberg constant for hydrogen, and we'll put the smaller number first for N1 and the larger number second for N2. So one over one, that's one. One over two squared, that's a fourth. So one minus a fourth is three fourths. So we have this times three fourths, and we gotta take one over that whole quantity. And we get 1.215 times 10 to the negative seven meters, which is 121 nanometers. And this follows in the UV spectrum. UV is everything from 10 nanometers up to 400 nanometers. So this wavelength of light we can't see. It's in the, the Lyman series. Um, but we can pull out a, a photodiode or a photographic plate and develop it and find the line that way.